So Ephesians chapter 6, let's start at verse 13. It says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take, uh, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall, uh, uh, ye shall be uh, able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplications in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all, uh, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I uh, ask that uh, tonight that you would fill me with your spirit, that your word would be as a fire shove in my bones, and Lord, that you would give us ears to hear what you would have uh, to speak to us tonight. And Lord, may your word fall upon the fertile soil of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight we're talking about the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. We've talked about the, you know, the many different, you know, differing areas of those things. And like I said, obviously, God's, you know, God's word, the Bible teaches us that the saints of God are enga uh, engaged in this, in this great spiritual conflict against a powerful, relentless enemy. We know from uh, verse 11 that the enemy is the devil, and the devil uh, comes against God's uh, people with uh, various wiles or, or schemes or different ways in verse 11. He does everything in his power to destroy our faith and to draw attention away from God. What God has given us, he knows he can't take, but what he's going to try and do is trying to nullify what God, is, uh, get, God has given to us. He's going to try and make that you know, kind of like null and void so you know, we don't actually use those things that God has given us. But God says, you know what, I'm giving you armor so you, that way you can have all those things, that way you can uh, be around those things. It is God's will for us that we stand against the devil and stand against those attacks of the devil. And the thing is, is that we don't do it on our own. We have Christ right there with us. Amen? That, uh, that Christ, uh, you know, is there as, you know, uh, you know, helping us in these things, and he gives us the armor to be able to withstand these things. And when he talks about, you know, you know that position of standing, as we've talked about before, you know, that is a, a soldier who refuses to yield even an inch of ground to an attacking foe. It's not the fact that we're going out there, just, you know, whatever, we already have it. We're already right there. And God says, you know what, don't, get, don't back up any. Don't give him an inch. The Bible says neither give place to the devil, right? So God has given, uh, given his people some, a very precious ground. He, we have the truth of who he is and of how he loves us. We have his church. We have his word. We have his spirit. We have his grace. We have his salvation. We have his blessings, and we have a whole bunch more that if I were to, that would probably be the rest of the service. But, you know, we're not going to go into every single uh, thing that God has given us. But like I said, the devil wants to nullify all the blessings of God because he knows that he, cannot, he can't steal them from you because, you know what, God's given them to you. And no one can take those away from you. Amen? So if we're going to stand and hold the precious ground that we've been given, then we must put on the whole armor of God. We've already looked at um, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the, the boots of peace, and the sword, uh, the, sorry, not the sword, but the uh, shield of, the, of faith, which we talked about last night. And I'm going to go through a few things. You know, please you know, forgive me for, for, for you know, repeating these over and over again, but I want us to understand th those different parts. So I'm going to go through those parts that we went through, but I'm going to go through it very quickly. And if you want to know what those are, there's several weeks that I've already talked about it, so about those things. So go back and you know, into those into detail about the different areas. But the belt of truth speaks of life that is built upon the faithfulness to the Word of God and to the God of the uh, of the Word. It speaks of our uh, being in truth, both uh, yeah, our being in tr uh, in both uh, in truth in both testimony and in our living. It's that. That belt of truth gives stability. Without the belt of truth, everything else falls. It's that stability in our life that we, uh, that we stand upon God's truth, the, the belt of truth. The breastplate of righteousness, righteousness speaks of a holy life. It speaks of a life that is lived in conformity to the word of God. So not only do we have you know, the word of truth, but then we have the breastplate of righteousness, which you know, we say, you know what, God, I'm going to be conformed to the word of God. That when I read this, 
I, you know, I don't just read it, but I say, God, you know what? Change me so that way I look more like you, right? We are conformed to him, conformed to his image, you know, and the fact that, you know, what that is is a holy life is a, uh, is a powerful defense against the attacks of the enemy. And the, uh, the thing is, is that what stops us from living a holy life is a life where, you know, we allow sin to dwell in us. If we, don't, if we leave sin to be unchecked in our life, that brings down that defense. When we allow sin to, you know, and I'm not saying you have to be perfect. We know this. You're not perfect. You're not going to be perfect. But here's the thing. If we allow, you know, just the sin to say, you know, I'm just going to keep doing it. What's the point of asking God for forgiveness? I don't, you know, I'm never going to be whatever. You no, know, you're allowing that sin to dwell in you, and it's going to bring down this defense. And so what you do you know, when you sin is that you ask God for forgiveness. You confess that sin, and the Bible says that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin, right? And so that's what we need to do, because the longer you allow it to dwell in you, the further you get away from him, and, and the thing is, is that, you know, the more backslidden you become. And, you know, to the point to where you're like, how did I get to this point as a believer? You know, you're like, I, I don't understand that. And so that, and then the next one was the boots of peace, you know, or the or, or, or have on our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It means that we are saved by grace and we know it. We know that, that we are saved by, by grace through faith and we know it, that nothing can change our minds. Satan may try and cause us to doubt, but when we wear the boots of peace, we are sure and secure in our salvation and we cannot be moved. We, do, we are not moved. Why? Because we know who we are in Christ. We know that, uh, that God has given us salvation and no matter what happens, we have that. That Satan can't take that away from us. The shield of faith speaks of our, uh, sorry, the boots of peace you know, talks, uh, speaks of uh, our foundation in Christ. We need to know that. We need to know that salvation, that's our firm foundation is upon Jesus Christ. The, uh, the shield of faith speaks of our daily life in God that causes us to trust him in all seasons of life. In all seasons of life. This is not just the times, you know, where things are going wonderful, where you feel like you're saved, where, you know, everything, you know, seems to be coming together. No, it's in all seasons of life. And you know what? Not all of us in this room, like all, you know, like all the seasons that we have in nature, let alone in all seasons of life, right? Because my wife likes snow, and my wife says, I want snow, and then you know, on Sunday morning I hear, no snow. So I know that there are ones in here that don't like it, but there are other ones that do. But this is in all seasons of life that no matter what happens, that we know that we can trust him. Why? Because the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. By faith. When bad times come, the just shall live by faith. When good times come, the just shall live by faith. Even when the fiery darts of the devil are raining down all around us, the shield of faith protects us and allows us to stay in the fight for the glory of God. So tonight we're going to look at the fa- uh, we're going to look at the helmet of salvation. The Bible says, "And take the helmet of salvation." So we uh, this is something obviously daily that we realize that we do is that we we take uh, the helmet of salvation, and it's not just picking certain parts every day. We go, okay, today I feel like ha- having the helmet of salvation. T- uh, tomorrow maybe you know I'll have my feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The next day I'll go. No, it's the every day you're you're going out there because I mean it would be kind of weird. If a person goes out there with a the belt of truth on, but they got nothing else, and they're like, you know, throwing like arrows, you know, shooting arrows at you, and you're like, I got my belt of truth on, you're going to get like lit up like no, no, no other, I'll tell you that right now. So the helmet of salvation, as we see in verse 17, it says, and take the helmet of salvation, right? Take it. The helmet worn by the ancient soldiers was of utmost importance. Why? Because it protects your head. Your head's pretty important, isn't it? So in other words, what this is, uh, you know, this is to, to resemble, you know, that it's protecting is what? Your mind. Your mind. Back in the day, you know, the helmets, you know, were made either of thick le- uh, leather uh, covered by pieces of metal. And sometimes they would go down like on the cheekbones and everything else. Why? Because that way your face didn't get like hit with an arrow or something like that. Or they were made of solid metal and they would actually beat that metal into the shape of a head. So that way it would obviously fit upon your head. So, you know, it actually did its purpose, right? And so um, we obviously know that, you know, that's the whole reason. But here's the thing, is that in ancient uh, times, many armies 
uh, employed a cavalry, right? You know, guys know, you know, you know what a cavalry is. Is you know they always say you know uh, you know call on the cavalry and they'll come in there and those are all the ones that will just you know run in there, right? And so um, these soldiers were mounted on horseback. So think about this: there were soldiers that were on uh, on horseback. Usually the cavalry was not on horseback, right? They were usually running, for the most part. Mostly, you know, running as they were going, and so, mo- and then the ones that were on the horseback carried what they call a broadsword. A broadsword. Uh, this is different. Uh, you know, uh, this is you know one that's about three or four feet in length, and it has a double edge on it as well. And so, what this is supposed to do is supposed to decapitate. We're supposed to like basically, you know, take somebody out, you know, like across the head, right? And so, with this. Um, with this, we are, we are to, uh, to, our, to so obviously our, uh, the text says that the spiritual helmet we are to wear in our uh, spiritual battles is the helmet of salvation. If, if you go out there in battle, you don't have a helmet on, and a guy's coming at you with a broad sword, what's going to happen? You, you're gone. Because he's just going to make one big sweeping blow and everything's gone, all right? And so... So, but this, like I said, it indicates that, that Satan's blows are aimed at our minds. He is intent on destroying our sense of security and our assurance in Christ. If the devil can strike a blow against, against us that causes us to be discouraged or filled with doubt, he will, uh, he will have little trouble sidelining us and take us out of the battle. If we doubt or we are discouraged, all of a sudden, I mean, it's kind of over with because people that are self to decide they're older, they're not engaged in battle. They're not going to go out there and be able to fight because you know what? They're going to go, you know what? I don't think I can do it. I think the enemy is going to take me out. I mean, you never watch a, you never watch like a, a war movie, whether it's like, you know, you know, uh, you know, more modern, like a World War II or World War I movie or something like that. Or you never watch ones like back in the day when they actually used swords and everything else. You never see soldiers going there going, I think I'm going to lose. I mean, how wonderful of a movie would Braveheart have been if William Wallace was like, yeah, I know I'm supposed to be here for Scotland, but you know what? I think we're all going to lose. I mean, that, you know, I mean, think about William Wallace, Mel Gibson out there on that horse going back and forth, giving his whole speech about, you know, what would we do without freedom, all sorts of stuff. How would that have changed if the entire, you know, climax of the movie, he goes, you know what? What would we do without freedom? I don't know. Let's just go back and be slaves again. You would have been like, this is the dumbest movie I've ever seen. You know, it's not even worth my time to watch this, right? And so if he comes at us like that, so number one is this. The devil, oh, sorry, not the devil. The helmet protects against discouragement. The devil will use, you know, will use both sides of that two-edged sword. One of those sides is discouragement and the other is doubt. That, that helmet is going to protect you against discouragement. That helmet is going to protect you against discouragement. If we are not properly protected, the devil will use the sword of discouragement to defeat us in our walk with the Lord. I mean, and there's many ways that he does this. I mean, even, let's for a moment consider the fact of the prophet Elijah. Elijah had, had amazing, amazing victories, right? He was a prophet of God, you know, amazing, you know, how God used them. And think about it, not too many uh, people enjoyed the, the string of, of spiritual victories like Elijah enjoyed. Praying, I mean, the man prayed fire down from heaven. Have you done that? You know, people are you know, like, oh, yeah, not this week, you know, a couple weeks ago, but, you know, not, not like last week. But, I mean, prayed, you know, fire uh, uh, down from heaven. He slayed 450 prophets of Baal. And uh, after three and a half years, he caused it not to rain. And that wasn't all. After he kills the prophets of Baal, he outruns King Ahab all the way to Mount Carmel, to Samaria. Now, when have you been able to outrun a horse and chariot on bare feet? I mean, come on now. I mean, so he has all these things going on. You would think, man, this guy's you know using you know used amazingly by God. Then the next day. There comes a word that Queen Jezebel, who was angry with Elijah, said this in 1 Kings 19.2, uh, it says this, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not 
uh, thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow at this time. Elijah hears this, and he runs away. He runs for his life. He's like, you know what? Ah- Ahab and Jezebel were married. He was more worried about the wife than he was about the husband. And he runs. He runs away, and he goes, and he hides. He goes over to, he travels to Beersheba and throws himself under a shrub and prays to die. Now, all that stuff I just said, don't you think that you're like, oh, man, he did all those amazing things. How could he ever, ever be discouraged? But yet he was. He was so discouraged that he was ready to quit on God, resign from the office, his office as prophet, and go out into eternity. He actually prayed that he would die. The next day, remember, he did all this stuff the day, you know, uh, you know the, the, the stuff prior, some of the stuff the day before. The next day, after he just had that happen, he goes over and says, you know what, Lord? Take me now. There's no way I can handle this. There's no way. I mean, I don't know if that speaks you know, to, to you know, how wicked that Jezebel was or what, but the fact that he all of a sudden, you know, he's like, I can take out Ahab. That's fine. I can take out his prophets of Baal. I can do all that kind of stuff because I know who my God is. But Jezebel, I don't know. So he prays that he goes on to eternity. But God shows up in the wilderness and rebukes the prophet. Here is what God had asked him in, in 1 Kings 19.9. He says, and he came uh, thither unto, uh, unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He says, What are you doing here? It's like, I did all that stuff for you the other day, and now you're here hiding in a cave. Elijah's reply indicated the state of his heart. He, sa- he says this in uh, verse 10. He says, And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord uh, God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down the, uh, thy, uh, thine altars, and slain thy prophets with a sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Oh, woe is me. He's like, you don't understand, God. All the prophets, all the, they come after, they kill them. I'm the only one left. I'm the only one that's dealing with this situation. Oh, woe is me. You don't understand, God. You don't understand. But in verse 18, God reassures Baal, or not Baal, reassures, I'm going to say Baal. I'm looking at Baal right down here on the, on the paper, and I read it. He reassures Elijah in a still small voice that what? That there are still 7,000 in Israel that have remained faithful and have not bowed to Baal. See, oh, even after his whole woe is me, they killed everybody. They're coming after me. I'm going to die. I whatever. God's like, you know what? There are still 7,000 that, you know, that are, have remained faithful and have not bowed to Baal. There are still 7,000 you know, believers out there that are still following me. You're not the only one. Well, you, know, that, you begin to sit there and go, man, that's, I don't understand how he, why he was so you know, worried about it. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, and I could say I don't understand it, but how many times have we ever been, or myself have been in a situation where, man, great spiritual victory, great spiritual victory. The next moment, oh, woe is me. Because I used to sit there and say, you know, and read, you know, read the accounts in the Old Testament. And I would sit there and say, man, how stupid could Israel be? How stupid could God's people be? And then I real, then God, you know, honestly, I felt like God spoke to me and says, how many times have you been that stupid? And I think God used that same language back because, you know, he's like, you know what? There have been many a times where you have given you victory after victory after victory, and then you all of a sudden are just like, woe is me. I'm the only one that's ever dealt with this. I'm the only one that's going through this. I'm the only one that has this problem. And you get discouraged. I mean, Elijah learned the truth that spiritual victory does not, does not insulate us against discouragement. You could have a whole bunch of times, where, you, know, you know, where you have all these spiritual victories, but that doesn't stop Satan from coming to try and discourage you. Satan doesn't go back, oh man, he's had all these victories. Whew, I better stay away from him. I mean, did he stay away from Job? I know I've talked about you know, Job a lot, but I mean, I sit there and think about the, you know, uh, Job. The man had everything, was doing everything right. Everything was going great in his life. Until God said, you know what, have you considered my servant Job? 
and I spoke that correctly. God said, have you considered my servant Job? And then Satan comes in and does what? He said, the only reason why he follows you, the only reason why is because you put this hedge of protection around him. You've given him all these things. You've done all these things. And as soon as you, you take all that away from him, he'll curse you to his face, to your face. And he never does. He never does. Now, you know, think about this. You may have been uh, saved for years, but if, uh, but if the devil can get you discouraged in your walk, he could take you out of, the, uh, out of that battle. He could take you out of the fight. If he can get you to, uh, to focus on your problems, on the failures in your life, on the shortcomings of others, or on any negative thing at all, he can overwhelm your defenses and cause you to doubt the Lord's goodness. And he will. He will try it. He will give it, you know, he's going to give it his best to do it. I mean, we can, we can think about it like this, but it's true. When we allow uh, problems and pain and people and other situations to make us uh, discouraged to the point where we want to quit on God, the devil has won that battle. For a period of time, he has caused us to doubt the goodness and the grace of God. Regardless of the reason we name, when we allow Satan to discourage to the point where we stop serving him, we are at that moment looking God in the face and telling him, I don't believe that you're bigger than this. I mean, think about that. I know that may seem far-fetched, but you know what? It's nevertheless, it's true. When we say that, you know what, that I don't think, you know, that God can, you know, do this, and you'll say, well, I would never think that, but your actions speak louder than words. I mean, like I said before, Job, my man Job, man, I mean, he, I mean, think about it. He had his helmet in place. He had that helmet of salvation in place, and there was nothing moving. Satan unleashed a fury, you know, the fury of hell against Job, and still refused, and Job still refused to doubt the goodness of God. Job didn't understand, uh, didn't understand why his children had to die, why, this, uh, why his health had to be taken away, and why everything he had worked for his entire life to amass was lost. But amid, uh, amidst the pain and the problems, Job continued to trust the Lord. Job 13, 5, he says this, Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Who is he talking about? The Lord. He says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. Job's helmet deflected every blow of the enemy and protected his fragile spirit from, uh, from injury. I mean, think about it. The man had his children taken away. Had his livestock taken away, had every, had his health, he had his you know, body was you know like was was overrun with boils, and his wife said, you know what? Why don't you just curse God and die? Just, and you know what? She gets a bad rap sometimes because some people are like, oh man, she's a horrible person. Well, think about it. If you're over here, your husband's, and he's loving the Lord, and the kids are loving the Lord, and, and whatever. And then one day, all of a sudden, the kids die, the livestock dies, whatever. and she knows who allows all the stuff, you know, who, who allows things in her life. She knows it's from the Lord. She's like, you know what? I mean, she's like, they took my kids. They took all the livestock. They took all the servants. They took all, everything. They took our, uh, you know, our entire life. And she just, I mean, she's had that you know, discouragement, to say the le- at least, and maybe uh, and probably doubting God. Her... Her helmet of salvation was not, you know, in the right place. I mean, we don't understand why that is, but the good thing is, is that we know uh, from reading that account that his kids were all believers. So even though that they died, you know, prematurely and everything else, you know, what we would consider prematurely, they were in heaven. It's not like all of a sudden, like, they were like, oh, well, like, some of them went to hell. No, they were all believers. She was one too, but you know what? The helmet of salvation for her was not in the right place. She allowed Satan, you know, uh, to go out there. Another man who wore the helmet of salvation, you know, uh, was was uh, the prophet Jeremiah. When the Lord called Jeremiah, the Lord told him that he would be rejected, persecuted, and attacked. Now, how many of you would be willing to follow the Lord 
or at least maybe keep your mouth shut a little bit more, if you were told that you're going to be rejected, persecuted, and attacked as a believer. Yet, this is what Jeremiah said in uh, Jeremiah 15, 16, says this, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord, o, o Lord God of hosts. Job had his helmet in the right place. He had it right there. I want you to open up to Psalm 73. Psalm 73. And there's a man by the name of Asaph. Asaph, uh, most times people don't ever talk about him, but he was, he's one of the ones that helped write the Psalms. And Asaph... Um, realizes this. It actually, as you read this, this is a long psalm. But I'm going to read it, and you tell me, who is he trusting in? Psalm 73, verse 1 says, truly God, is, uh, truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. Uh, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had, uh, had well, nigh, well nigh slipped. For I was envious, uh, envious at, the foolish, at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands uh, in their death, but their strength is, a, uh, is firm. They are not in, uh, in trouble as other men, neither are they uh, played like other men. Therefore pride uh, compass, uh, compasses them about as a chain. Violence uh, covereth them as a garment. Their eyes uh, stand out with uh, fatness. They have more, uh, than, uh, more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning depression. They speak lo uh, loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their uh, tongue walks through the earth. Therefore, his people return uh, hither and uh, in waters of a full cup are wrung out uh, to them. And they say, how does God know? And is there and it, uh, is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. So far you're going, man, he's looking at everybody and thinking that, they're, you know, that, that they got it better almost, right? Verse, four, uh, verse 13 says this, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency for all the day long. Have I been plagued and chastened every morning? If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend. I should offend against the generations of the generation of thy children. When I thought to know, uh, thought to know this, it was painful to, uh, for me, until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their end. So this is where you begin to see the change. When does it happen? When he realizes who he is in Christ. Verse 18, surely uh, thou didst uh, set in slippery places, thou, uh, thou casted them down into destruction. How are they uh, brought into uh, desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one awakes. Uh, so, O Lord, uh, when thou awakest, thou, uh, thou, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved. And I, uh, and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast a uh, holden of me by my right hand. Thou, hast, uh, thou, uh, shall, thou shall guide me with uh, thy counsel. And afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none, none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart uh, faileth, but, my, uh, but God is the strength of my, life, of my heart and my uh, portion forever. For lo, they that are, far from, uh, that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But it is good for me to, uh, to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. I mean, think about that. He has all that. He's talking about all this stuff, how, how these people are making money. It seems like they're prospering. They're doing all these things. But it's not until the fact that he realizes, he says, I'm going to go to the sanctuary of God. I'm going to uh, um, realize, you know, 
And he begins to put his trust where? In the Lord. He says, they can have all that stuff. It doesn't matter to me. Why? Because I put my trust in him. So he goes from the, you know, the fact of not having his, his, you know, that helmet of salvation in place to where he says, you know what, I think I need to you know, get her fitted again and put her back on. And then he begins to realize of where his trust is or where his trust needs to be. Number two is this, the helmet protects against, uh, protects against doubt. The helmet protects against doubt. The other edge of the Satan's broad sword is doubt. When we come, uh, when we come to doubt, our salvation, and when we, uh, and, or when we come to doubt the word of God, we are easily defeated by the enemy. When we sit there and we have those things, that we sit there and, and uh, um, we, like I said, either doubt our salvation or doubt what God's word is actually telling us, then we're easily defeated. When we, uh, when we doubt our salvation, we will be discouraged. Like I said, there are days where we won't feel saved. And we may question, you know, God, I'm not really feeling it, you know, did and you know what? We need to understand what, God is, you know, what God's word has told us. When we doubt God's faithfulness, we are easily discouraged. When we, uh, uh, when we come to doubt the word of God, we have the very foundations for our hope in the Lord undermined, and we have no ground upon which, uh, which to stand. If Satan can convince you that you are not really saved, or that somehow you have lost your salvation, you will be devastated spiritually. And such doubt obviously paralyzes the believer and makes them unproductive and miserable. Nothing more uh, quickly sidelines the child of God than having their peace and security in Jesus stripped away. When we forget this truth that Jesus spoke in John 14, 27, it says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, Give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. God, God does not, you know, promise peace like the world does. All those countries that are over in Europe right now fighting in, uh, wars, they all promise to be peaceful at one time or another. How long did that peace last? A few years, a couple decades maybe? Maybe. But God promises you peace forever, no matter what. He didn't say that, you know what, in this life that you're going to have all peace. He says, you know, but the thing is, he says, I leave you a, a peace that is going to pass all understanding. You, you can have stuff going on in your life, turmoil, all kind of chaos, everything going on, everybody hating you and everything else. But you know who you are in Christ, and you can still have a peace. That's why the Bible says that it's a peace that's, uh, that passes all understanding. Because you can sit there and go like this, you like, man... My life should be terrible right now. I should be a wreck. I should be on an emotional roller coaster, but I'm not. I have peace. Amen? Amen? It's like you can have all this junk coming at you, everything flying at you, going like this. You're like, ain't nothing. I got, I got Christ. I got peace. Amen? Amen. Satan's going to try and take that. He wants you to doubt. He wants you to be discouraged. He wants those things. Why? Because he doesn't want you to have that peace. He wants to try and nullify it so you think that you don't have peace when you actually do have peace. If Satan has been beating you uh, with that sword, let me remind you that you are in Jesus and you are secure in Jesus. Let's read, uh, I'm going to read you know, a few verses here. John chapter 6, verse 37 through 40 says this. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. And him that uh, cometh to me, I will in what? No wise cast out. What does that mean? He's not going to get rid of you. If you've come to him, you've received him, you got saved, he's not going to cast you out now. He's like, you know what? You're mine. Let's go on. It says, For I came down from heaven, not to do uh, mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the uh, Father's will which uh, hath sent me, that, all, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me that everyone which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now think about that. He said, I'm not going to cast you out. He says, you know what, I lose nothing, which is an awesome thing because I lose, like, you know, like every time I lose keys and whatever, and I just had it. I lose my train of thought going from room to room. Am I the only one? 
walking into that room, walking into that kitchen, be like, kitchen, I, there's something I'm coming, it has to be food, there's a refrigerator in there, it has to be food, and it would be something else, be like scissors, because we keep our scissors in a drawer in the kitchen, so, I'm like, no, I'm not hungry though, I don't know why I came there. He says he's not going to lose anything. He, what did he say? He says, this is the will, uh, will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son and believes on him. Isn't that the day you got saved? The Bible says, but believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Believe on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John chapter 10, verse 20 and 29 says this. A few chapters over. A few pages over. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. How many people could pluck you out of the Father's hand? No one. No one. Even for those that say, well, you know what, no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand, but I can get it out of my... No, no man... They'll say, well, I can wiggle my way out and whatever, and I can lose. No, man. Do you think you're stronger than God's hand? Uh, I sit there and I go, think about that for a second. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So what can separate you from the love of God? Nothing. Nothing. Satan doesn't want you to remember these things. That God's not going to cast you away after he already saved you? No one's able to pluck you out of his hand? That nothing can separate you from the love of Christ? Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know, how, you know when that day of Jesus Christ is? Is that when he calls us home. That's when that day is. 1 Peter chapter 1. off and then you guys have to hear that over the speaker first peter uh, one starting at verse three says blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through salvation, or sorry, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. He has, he's kept you, right? When Paul says, take the helmet of salvation, he's not referring to being saved. He is, after all, speaking to people who are already saved. When he, uh, uh, what he means here is that we are able to stand in the full assurance of salvation we possess in the Lord. We are to hold on to that truth. That, uh, we are holding on to the truth that if we are saved, the Lord has redeemed us and has promised everlasting life. That knowledge will allow us to deflect the broadsword of doubt when the devil tries to attack us in the arena of salvation. When Satan comes against you, he will... And he will stand your ground in the Lord, knowing that you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, it says that he bought you with his precious blood. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, 19 through, uh, and 20, it says that you are his. In Hebrews chapter 13, 5, and in Isaiah 43, 2, it says what? He will not leave you nor forsake you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, He will give you grace sufficient for the attacks that come against you. He will keep you through the battles of life, and He will deliver you safely home to glory when this life is over. 
2 Timothy 1.12 says, for, for, the which, uh, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which, he, that which I have committed unto him against that day. That would be the, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, which was you know, spoken of earlier. He says that he is able to keep. Who is able to keep you, Christ? He's not going to go, oops, I, I, you know, I just, I just lost Michael. Oopsies. He doesn't lose that which is his. Here's the key. And I believe that everyone in this room, you know, is this way. But I know we have other ones watching. Be sure you're saved. Be sure that you, have, uh, that you have more than just a church membership or some vague religious experience. Oh, I remember, I got goosebumps. That doesn't mean you're saved. I, I got goosebumps the other day too. It was called, I, you know, I needed to put on a jacket and you know, another, you know, some warm, you know, warmer stuff. But that's how some people are. They'll go to camps, they'll go to concerts, they'll go, oh, I felt, you know what, sometimes, you know what, it's, you're not going to have that, you know, feeling. Like, I've met a lot of people saying, well, you know what, you know, somebody told me I was in a, you know, I was in a feel, like when I prayed this prayer, that I was in a feel this way. I was in a feel. You can't go by your feelings. The Bible says that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. That means your feelings. Can your feelings deceive you? There's a lot of times where I sat there and said, oh, this seems like a good idea. Came back, you know, about, like, you know, like a day later or something like that, or even a couple of years later, and going, man, that was stupid. That's why you can't go off of your feelings. There are people out there, you know, that will go off of some religious experience saying, oh, I'm saved because I, I felt something changing me. Sometimes that happens. That's good, great. I'm not, you know, I'm not denying that. But the thing is that not every single time. I've met people that you pray with them, didn't feel necessarily anything, but they were saved. Because sometimes, you know, I, I, I can't say why some people feel things and other things that you always don't. I don't understand it. But I've, I've met some people that have, have felt things like, oh, I feel like I'm saved. And the next week, it was like they never even said a word. They, like they didn't even want Jesus anymore. Be sure that you are trusting nothing but Jesus for salvation. Be sure that you are resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. If you don't know what the finished work of Jesus Christ is, it's that death, burial, and resurrection. Because that right there is enough to save you. More than enough to save you. Be sure you're born again. Be sure you are believing the gospel. That's why it's very important that you believe the right gospel too. Because there are so many people out there that are listening to a false gospel. The false gospel nowadays is that you have to repent of all your sins in order to be saved. Because they'll, they'll read verses like, I think it's Mark 1.15 that says, uh, repent, and be, uh, uh, repent and believe the gospel. All right there it says, repent of your sins. What did I say? Was it, or what did Jesus say? It says, repent and believe the gospel. Right there it says it. Repent of your, all your sins in order to be saved. Does God's word say that? That word repent does not mean of all, you know, turn from all your sins. That word repent to you means to change direction, to change your mind. So what is he telling you? You know what? Stop believing in the stuff that you've been believing in and believe the gospel. That's what it means. Not repent of all your sins. And I told you this before, but, you know, and I'll, I'll tell you this again. Who teaches that? As Mormons. Mormons teach that the more you repent of your sins, that the whiter your skin will get, and you will get to go to heaven. It's not racist at all. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But the thing is, is that that has crept into Christianity. That has crept in, you know, into the modern church. We've been out, you know, preaching the gospel to people, and people have said, why is your gospel different than the other one? Yours sounds right, but this other guy had me, you know, saying that I had to repent of every single one of my sins that I've ever committed. I was like, I was like, well, let's think about it for let's think about this just logically. 
has anybody in here or listening or whatever, has anybody been able to repent of every single sin that they've ever committed? I have a hard time, you know, sometimes, you know, like, you know, turning away from the one sin that I'm focused on at that moment in time, let alone all the sins, even the, because the, the Bible says that even the thought of foolishness is, is sin. I know I've had you know, quite a few foolish thoughts come across my mind. I'll tell you that right now. Oh, good, I'm not the only one. All right. Thank you. thought maybe, maybe I was on my own. But that's one of the biggest ones. There, you know, there's other ones that say, you know what, you not only got to repent of your sins. Because they'll say, well, yes, it is by faith alone. But you got to you know, repent of your sins. You got to be water baptized. Some will say you got to speak in tongues. Some say you got to be a church member. Some will have this whole, they're like, oh, yeah, salva- salvation is faith alone. Oh, you got to continue to live a holy life. Oh, yes, but it is faith alone. And a little more. No. The Bible says, you know, how you're saved. I mean, when you have a guy you know, who flat out asks in Acts chapter 16, he says, what must I do to be saved? Has that question. That was the time. I mean, did Paul and, and Silas, did they miss it? Did they forget all of a sudden? They're like, oh, yeah. I know I said believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but I knew I should have I, I told him to repent of all his sins and be water baptized and do all this and do this, this, and this. Paul didn't miss anything. Why? Because he was under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And when he wrote, you know, when he, he writes his epistles, when Luke, who was, you know, uh, who was there writing down the things in the book of Acts, they wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They didn't miss anything. Because the Bible tells us, you know, going back to believe, you know, be sure you are believing the gospel. That's my little tangent, you know, about salvation for a little bit there. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 5, it says this, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know, uh, know ye not your own selves, but how that Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 says, Wherefore, uh, the rather brethren give diligence to make your, call, your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall no, uh, never fall. And I want you to realize that when I'm talking about the fact of making sure that you're saved and all these things, I'm not trying to make anyone in here doubt their salvation. I'm not trying to get you to doubt it, you know, be discouraged, like, I don't think I'm really saved, I don't know, whatever, pastor just, pff, we're in a room I thought with all saved people, but pastor's over there, you know, saying, you know, that we're not. No, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to make you doubt your salvation. I am simply trying to get you or in other people to examine whether or not they're saved. Because that's the most important thing in your life is that, is where you're going. And I want you to be sure that you're saved. I don't want you, uh, you know, I don't want you to go to hell trusting some false profession of faith. I want you to be able to stand when the enemy comes against you and seeks to make you doubt. I fear that sometimes we blame our doubts on the devil when all the time it is the Lord who is trying to show us that we need to be born again. And some of us will say, you know what, I got saved under pastor so-and-so. I got whatever. Who cares who you got saved under? I could tell you, you know, who, who led me to the Lord. I could tell you. But it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Jesus is not going to go, well, I didn't really like him. And he led you to the Lord? Well, I'm sorry. Because I didn't really like him. Yeah. No, he's going to ask you, why should I let you in? Well, so-and-so, you know, they led me. He's not going to, he does not care who led you to the Lord. He's going to ask, and your response, for those that are saved, is going to be what? I trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I can't do it on my own. And then what will you say? You say, I mean, ultimately, we, all, you know, we need to ask that question of, you know, Jesus, take the wheel. Ultimately, that has to be, that has to be the, you know, the main thing, sorry. But that's that, you know, that's that, you know, 
that's that portion that we need to realize is that the most important question is that is whether or not we're saved because when we come up, when we come before him he says why should i let you in you say well i trusted in your son i trusted in the death burial and resurrection that i couldn't do it on my own i needed him and what is he going to say to you well done thou good and faithful servant you may enter in it has nothing to do with you know with because you know the thing is is that if we could brag about like us being a part of salvation we would if we could say, you know, like, well, pff, you should have seen what I did. I mean, my, love, my life was terrible and everything else, but, you know, I, I just, I sold everything that I had. I gave all this others. I mean, if we could brag about, like, you know, like, you know, like trying to take Jesus out of the equation, we would. If we could save ourselves, if we could pay our way into heaven, or we could do so many good works, we would. We would try, we would say, you know what? And we would say, I mean, it's like having, you know, one of those meetings where you see a whole bunch of people that maybe were on drugs at one time or a whole bunch of alcoholics and everything else. And then somebody comes up and says, I don't have an awesome testimony. Yes, you do. Whatever your testimony is, that's an awesome testimony. Whether you're saved as a young child, which I think is the best t- testimony, or the fact you got saved later on in life, you got saved. That's the testimony that you should be proud of. Don't sit there and be like, I, I met people that, I, I, had a, I had a friend once, you know, that, and it, 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 it boggled my mind, who said, I think I want to go out, and I just want to, he, he, he planned out, like, I want to go do this, and this, and this, so that way I have an awesome testimony. He want to talk about, like, he's like, I want to go out and become an alcoholic, and do this, and this, and I had all this, and he did. And then I you know, talked to him a few years ago, and he goes, that was stupid. I said, I told you it was stupid when you told me you were going to do it. I said, but I can't say that you never, you know, that you didn't keep your promise that you were going to do those things. I was just hoping that you were, you know, like were, I don't know, out of your mind at that moment. And you're going, well, you know what, that's a dumb idea. I shouldn't do it. But yet he did and came back and said, you know what, that was stupid. I said, I told you it was. It was just, it boggles my mind sometimes how people could think. That they think that somehow they got to make it, you know, so that way it's that much better of a testimony. No, you, you got saved. That's the testimony right there, that you were on your way to hell, that you had all these things going, you know, on in your life, that you try to take control of your life, and it didn't work. And you know what? And God said, you know what? I want you anyways. I'm going to forgive you of all that. Are you secure in your salvation? Do you believe that Jesus Christ, you know, that you are trusting in him 100%? But here's the thing. How about that discouragement? How about that doubt? Because God's going to come back, or sorry, not God's, Satan's going to come back at you with that broad sword of doubt and discouragement. And he's going to keep on, you know, just taking a swing at you and seeing if he can get you. Because he wants to take you out of the battle. He wants to nullify what God has already given you. He wants you to think that you don't have what you already have in Christ. That's what we need to realize. That's what we need to know is that God has enabled you to stand against everything that the devil throws at you. You, uh, you do not have to uh, be defeated by the devil. You can withstand the withering assaults of discouragement and doubt. Bring those things to God and get some help. Those areas that you know, I sit there and, re- uh, and realize. When I started reading Psalm you know, seventy three, I read Psalm seventy three today, and there was like, you know, I'm, I'm going to be honest. There was some like doubt and discouragement that came into my mind and stuff like that. And I said, you know what? And I read, I read this, and right after I read it, I said, you know what? I said, the Lord just lifted me up. That's what I needed to read. I just, uh, I needed that because, and like I say, no matter how long you've been a Christian or no longer a believer, he's going to keep pounding at you and pounding at you and pounding at you until he can get you to that point. But thank the Lord for, you know, for men like, you know, Asaph, who, who wrote down his struggle of what he went through and then said, you know what, you know, I was messed up. I'm going to trust the Lord no matter what. Why was I even doubting that?